Again, I know for those of you who are visiting, um, this is not my normal voice. I usually have a lot more energy and I'm probably a lot stronger and a lot clearer, so I just apologize for that. I feel bad about it. I've never, I don't think I've ever felt, I don't want to say this bad because that sounds horrible, but I've never had to deal with something for six or seven weeks. And most of you who know me, uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm not a very patient person. I don't preach on patience because I'm not very good at patience. Um, I'm usually a pretty high energy person and I just feel really bad when I don't have all of my energy. So just bear with me again this morning. Thank you for just giving me the grace last week not to be here. Um, I trust that you were in good hands with Tom Swearinga. Tom is a good friend of mine. I love Tom. He loves this church. And uh, he said he was blessed to be here. So just thank you for just allowing that grace and just allowing us to be, to be real. And uh, my prayer is that God makes us strong even in our weakness, right? Right? Amen? We can say amen here. Those who are visiting, it's okay to say amen. I'm giving you permission. If you come from a church where you couldn't say amen, you have permission here to say amen. So if you're in agreement with something I say, I want you to say amen. Because then, hey, thank you, okay? I want to know you're tracking with me. Um, for those of you who are with me each week, you know that my messages are more teaching than they are preaching. I like to have interaction. I like to have engagement because I like to know you're tracking with me. When you're tracking with me, I know I'm on track, okay? People don't like to be preached at. Tell a kid something for too long and they say, quit preaching at me, right? God wants us to learn. Teaching. So this morning, I want us to learn again from God and his word. If you haven't been here for the last several weeks, I've been doing a series of messages, and I've entitled them First Things First. And I think with anything in life, we've got to be really, if, if we don't follow the instructions, if we take out an, uh, an instruction, if we're building something, and it's a kit or something, and it has 20 instructions, you don't start with number 10, do you? Or number 12, you start with number one. When you start with number one and you follow the directions or the instructions, things generally will fall in place and work better along the way, correct? Amen? All right, we're all in agreement on that. So for the first five weeks of the year, we're doing this series on our core values. And I've called the series First Things First. And if you look at those core values very quickly, the first one is loving relationships. And that's based on Matthew 22. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's priority number one, right? What was job number one at the Ford Motor Company? Quality. You know what job number one is in the church? Love. Jesus said, if you get this right, if you get this right, people will know. It will show. And it'll make a difference. So number two is inspiring simple worship. And we often think of worship, we're coming to worship. But you know what? I challenged this church and I said, worship isn't just about Sunday morning for an hour. God calls us to worship 24-7. Every minute of our lives, everything we do is an act of worship, isn't it? The chief end of man, according to the Westminster Confession, is to glorify God, to worship God. Huh? Worship is 24-7. And we looked at what it meant to worship. We looked at the story of Abraham and Isaac and Abraham sacrificing Isaac. And how that was a picture, a foreshadow of how God would send Jesus and sacrifice his son as an act of worship, okay? Number three, we looked at passionate spirituality. And when we looked at that, what I said with that is, what does our personal devotional life look like? What is our spirit? How passionate are we? Why do we come here? And when we come here, are you really expecting to have an encounter with God? See, when Abraham went to the, went to the mountain to, 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 um, uh, to sacrifice Isaac, he said, we will worship there, but God will provide. God will show up. And I often wonder as Christians, I challenge us, when we offer our prayers or when we come to church, do we really expect to see God when, he, when we come in here? Do we really expect to encounter God? Where two or three are gathered, he's there. We believe that, Amen then we should expect to encounter God in our worship. Mick so eloquently put it in our leadership retreat yesterday, his number one priority for worship on Sunday mornings is to bring you into the presence of God 
long before I ever get up here and open God's word. That's worship. That's worship. Ministry involvement, we looked at that two weeks ago. And we talked about the gifts and talents God has given us, and we focused on our gifts and using them in the church. This morning, I want to look at the fifth value, and it's sincere, caring service. And it doesn't state it there, but the value, I think I put the value on the screen. It says this, we value serving our Lord by being his hands and feet to all those around us. If you look at that fifth value, it's really the pinnacle. It's the culmination of the first four values. And let me just preface where I get that from, from Scripture. If you look at Scripture, there's verses that I like to call life verses. Those are the verses that not only give us life, but give others life. Let me preface that by saying that in John 10.10, Jesus says, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the fullest. Jesus didn't say, I came to give you a little bit of life on Sunday. I came to give you life and have it to the fullest. That's a life promise. And when I look at how Jesus calls us to claim that promise, there's three life verses, and I can't do three very well. Go like this. My kids always laugh at me. I'm pointing wrong fingers. Three life verses. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus, well, let's look at this way. Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 22, and Matthew 28, for me, are three critical verses as not just a pastor, but I think they should be for all of us as Christians. And those verses are this. In Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus is walking along the Galilee, and Jesus finds these fishermen, huh? the first disciples. They didn't have a rabbi. They didn't have a chance of faith. They weren't good enough. They didn't make the cut. And Jesus went up to those fishermen and he said, I want you to leave your boats. I want you to leave your fishing business, which by the way was a family business. They'd probably inherit. And he said, I want you to leave them. And he said, I want you to follow me. And he says, and I'm going to give you purpose. You're going to discover your purpose when you follow me. That's Matthew chapter 4. Things get complicated as they discover their purpose. They're working, they're helping him, there's miracles. There's all kinds of chaos. There's political chaos and turmoil, even back then, right? And they're saying, Jesus, how do we handle this? And the Pharisees, the Sadducees, there's all these arguments and it's all confusing. And they say, what are we supposed to do, Jesus? You told us to come and follow you. What are we supposed to do? And Jesus comes back and he says, it goes back to number one. Love me above all and love your neighbor as yourself. So they move on from there, loving, right? And then the day comes when Jesus is going to leave them. And Jesus' last words are our first command. First of all, Jesus says, follow me. Jesus says, learn from me. And third, Jesus says, be me. Go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? I want you this morning for a couple of minutes to look what happened when those disciples did that. Follow me, love me, be me. Okay? Follow me, love me, be me. When the disciples did that, watch what happens. The book of Acts. We talked with Clarissa about the Holy Spirit, right? When the believers were gathered together at the time of Pentecost, it says all the believers were gathered in one place in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit came upon them, right? Look what happened when those spirit-led believers, spirit-filled believers went into action. Acts 2, 42 through 47. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' preaching or teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers... That's just some of the believers. All the believers met together in one place. They shared everything they had. They sold their property, possessions, their money. They shared it with those who had need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. 
They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those numbers or those being saved, those added who were being saved. I don't know how often you think about that text or how much you've thought about that text. But you know what happened there? They started a movement, didn't they? They started a movement. I go back and I look at it and I say, you know what they practiced? Value number five, sincere, caring service. That group practiced sincere, caring service. And what did they do? They did five things. Well, let me say this. They committed themselves to five things. Commitment. The ministry team knows I talked a lot about commitment this week, and I want to do some series on what it means to be committed. Because I think if there's one thing that's happening in our world, there's a lack of commitment, huh? In a lot of different, anybody agree with me on that? Commitment isn't what it used to be. And God doesn't call us to be halftime followers, does he? He calls us to be fully committed. A lot of people buy into Christianity, but not as many sell out. And I just said something there. That comes back to commitment. But these believers, okay, for the lack of time this morning, they did five things. Number one, they committed themselves to fellowship. They gathered regularly. They shared. They learned. They got into each other's homes. You know what they really did? They did life groups. They practiced life group living. The second thing they committed themselves to was discipleship. Ties right back into passionate spirituality. They were studying the apostles, preaching and teaching. They committed themselves to it. They were learning what it meant to be Jesus. They didn't just soak it up, but then they lived it out. They learned what it meant to be Jesus. They practiced spiritual disciplines. <coughs> oh, excuse me. The third thing they did is they committed themselves to ministry, supporting the needs, ministry involvement, each other's needs. They used their gifts to serve each other. The fourth thing they committed themselves to was outreach. They engaged in serving. It says they were generous. They gave themselves away and they drew others to Christ. The last thing they did was worship, that 24-hour, 24-7 worship that I was talking about. I don't know if you've picked up on this, but I want those of you who are in life groups to think about that. Those are the five characteristics of healthy life groups. Those are the very five basic foundations of healthy life groups. Those are the five basic foundations of a healthy missional church. And do you know what happened when they practiced those five values? Verse 47b says, Each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. How many people would that be if we did that as a church every day? How many more people would we have at the end of the year? Come on. One person a day, how many days in a year? 365, huh? All right, just making sure you're with me. 365. Wouldn't that be awesome? It's what happened to them when they were committed to those five values. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Huh? You see the mission of the church, people? It's not that complicated. It's just hard to do, isn't it? Some people are easier to love than others too, aren't they? But God tells us to love them all. Love them all, warts and all. Love those who don't even love you, huh? Those believers started a movement called the church. We're part of that movement. We follow in those lines of the apostles. And then they're told, go into all the world, huh? Go into Judea, go into Jerusalem, start with Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the ends of the earth. Here's my big question this morning. Where are you going? Where are you going? Where's your Jerusalem? Where's your Judea? Where's your Samaria? Where's the end of your earth? See, the fact too is we've been baptized with that Holy Spirit just like Clarissa, and we've been given the command to go We've been given the gifts to go. Sounds like a website. Gifts to go.com. Huh? 
Where are you going? Where are you going? What I want you to take away from this this morning is this, that all of us as Christians, if we have the presence and power of the Holy Spirit within us, I believe that we've been given gifts, amen, to serve. And we haven't been given those gifts to just sit on them. We've been given those gifts to use inside and out of the church, inside these four walls and outside of these four walls, and maybe to the ends of the earth. What I want you to understand, and especially for visitors, this is a church that is committed to going. I take Jesus' command, his last words, very seriously to go into all the world. That's one of the reasons why you have a team of people leaving for Corinto this week, Friday. Because we take that serious. God says, go into all the world and make those disciples. That's why every week I tell you to grab the 4C, because every week there's opportunities for you to serve somewhere in this ministry or outside of this ministry. As a church member, one of the things we promised, and we promised that to Clarissa, is that we would be there for her. That means we're going to use our gifts to teach her as, a, as in Sunday school or a profession of faith class. We're going to teach her how to serve God. But the only way she's going to get that is if we do it, isn't she? Is if we model that. And one of the things when we make our professions of faith as members of the church is that we promise to use our gifts. We promise to accept the responsibilities of church ministry. So my challenge this morning is simply this. That everybody is plugged in serving somewhere. I think I'm pretty clear on that, right? What that means? Everybody's been given gifts. We've all been given a command to love and to go. And we all have to use those gifts somewhere in the church. We owe that not just to each other, but we owe that to God. That's why God's given us those gifts. There's a statement sometimes that 20% of the people do 80% of the work, right? I'd like to see that number increase. Because you know what I find And Jesus promised this, when you give your life away, you find it. If we don't give our life away, we're cheating ourselves out of the joy God gives us for using those gifts and serving others. If we don't give our life away, we cheat others out of the blessings that we could give them through God's gifts. And maybe the biggest thing is we cheat God when we don't use our gifts. I know when I get to heaven one day, I I know there's going to be a list of mistakes I made. But I hope there's more good on the good side than there is on the bad side. And I hope that someday I'm going to be able to look at it and say, you made a difference in this person's life or that person's life, and to be found faithful. And honestly, if I can just, from the bottom of my heart, that's what I'm asking you this morning. I want you to be found faithful. God says to go. Where are you going? If I can even just be bold and selfish, say, it's not about you. Don't be selfish. Give yourself away because when you give yourself away, you will not only find it, but what you will find is that the blessings come back to you far greater return than anything you've ever given. And those of you who serve and serve well know that's the case. We walk away so many times thinking, I'm the one who got blessed. In a few minutes, I'm going to invite Steve Meyer and Dave Dornboss and Lisa to come up and lead the commissioning service for a few minutes to close us out this morning. But I was asked this morning, why are we going to Corinto? What is our chief mission in Corinto? Why are we going to Corinto? Why am I going to sleep in a bug tent on a cement floor? And I need to be grateful because most people don't have cement floors in Corinto. And I'll be really honest with you, I'm still very nervous about this, especially with my health right now. But why am I doing that? Because you know why? I think when I go there and give myself away, the person that's going to be changed the most is me. Because I think God's going to teach me something. And if you notice in my prayer before, I said, keep us humble and keep us teachable. We have a big, big God in a big, big world. And we can learn so much from each other. Why are we going to Corinto? To go there and encourage these people who have never had church people come there before. They are in the end of the earth. But we're going to go there and we're going to love them. I'm going to melt when I get there. 
because they're going to have a welcoming committee and I'm going to be one sobbing mess. And then I got to preach a few hours after that when I get there and then preach again on Sunday. You know what I'm going to preach to them about? Love, love, love. I'm going to learn from my brothers and sisters and I don't know when I'll see them again on this earth, but I know that my time on this earth is growing shorter and shorter. And one day I'm going to celebrate with them and maybe then I'll understand their language. And we'll be able to have the conversation that we might not have next week. But it's about going into all the world and being found faithful, isn't it? Where are you going? We're sending a team to Corinto as a church. You've been a part of that. The fundraising, the prayers, the gatherings. You're all part of this. And I can't wait till two weeks from now when we come back. And we're going to dedicate that service to sharing. Just like the spies who went in to look at the promised land and came back and gave their report and said, wow, man, the fig trees, the branches, like nothing you've ever seen, right? Eight people are going to come back and give their report. But the question I have for you this morning is beyond your prayer support, beyond your partnership for Corinto, where are you going to go? On your sheets, on your seats, excuse me, are sheets. And I want you to grab those sheets for a minute, okay? There's an eight and a half by 11. A talent survey. We haven't done this in a while. And I know I'm just kind of throwing this out there at you this morning, but if we believe we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, we've been given gifts, we believe that God is serious when he tells us to go, what I want every person in this church to do is to take that sheet. Okay, now you don't have to fill it out now. Now that's not a license not to fill it out. But I want every person seriously... If we're committed to Christ, we should be, as church members, we should be committed to serving. And on this sheet, it, it, it indicates whether or not you're willing to serve on one of the ministry teams, okay? It talks about the gathering ministry, okay? If you're willing to be part of Sunday, part of growing, that's our education, part of our orange ministries, if you're willing to serve in that. Then there's the out, outreach part of it, the going piece, the household needs, okay? Okay? There's all kinds of stuff in there. Everything from providing a meal to child care to transportation to helping on a Saturday morning. If you're willing just a couple times a year to give of your time to serve in some of those areas, and we have a lot of new members here. We haven't done this. We're just asking you, where do you think God wants you to serve? We just want, we want to have a database because when people call us each week or there's opportunities, we'd like to say, you know what? We can call that person because they volunteered. So it provides us with a database of people who are willing to serve so we can go out and be faithful to that mission. Maybe it's with our partnerships, Young Lives, God's Club, Carinto, our service days, or Bice Community Assistance Center. If you flip over the page, maybe there's other passions. You know, as a ministry team this weekend, we heard of several people who want to start doing things in this church. We said, we want to empower people to pursue their passions. Where do you want to serve? That's really the bottom line of this morning. You see, we need to make it more than just a mission. The value is what drives this church. It's what we do and how we do things. I want to just close by saying this, two words, thank you. The ministry team heard me say that every session, Friday and Saturday, thank you for serving. Because nothing makes my heart, and it's not about me, but nothing warms my heart more than when I hear how people are serving. You know, this past couple of weeks have been a, a couple of difficult weeks for some of our members to lose loved ones so tragically, unexpectedly. And for me to get a call from the sheriff's department in the morning. And then I, you go and I say, what can we do for you? And my first question is, is your life group there? And the response was, our life group has been incredible. Our life group came rushing in like first responders. And they're taking care of our needs in ways that we could have never imagined. And I'm like, thank you, God. Thank you for serving hearts who care. That's what living our vision is about, isn't it? I know we've had some pregnancies lately that have created challenges for families and opportunities for the church to love and be there. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being there. When you see a need, fill
fill it. Do something. What does that song say? We sang it a couple weeks ago. All the complaints the guy has. And he says, God, why didn't you do something? And he said, I did. I created you. I created you. I don't think I can be any clearer this morning what the challenge is. Each one, serve somewhere. Fill these sheets out. There's two buckets when you leave. If you fill them out now, awesome. Put them in the buckets under the doors. If you need a week to think about it, think about it. But I want us to honor God by being a a church that truly does live up to its mission and takes the Great Commission seriously that we all use our gifts to change this world. Huh? Amen. Let's pray that I'm going to invite Steve and Dave and Lisa forward to lead us in the commissioning of the Carrington team. Father God, we thank you for this reminder this morning. I just thank you for your word that not only tells us what to do, but that you give us opportunities like this to be encouraged. I know that's not easy. Sometimes we don't like to be out of our comfort zone. Or we like to be comfortable. But Lord, you didn't call us to be comfortable. You called us to be holy and obedient. So Lord, I pray that you speak to each one. For those who are serving and serving well, Lord, give them the energy, the passion, the drive to continue doing that. For those who are maybe waiting for their opportunity, may this be the time when they say, yes, count me in. I'm part of this church. I'm owning up to my responsibilities and I'm going to make a difference. Lord, use us as a church like you did the Acts 2 church to start a movement, to touch hearts, to change lives and ultimately change this world and even the most remote regions of this world. Thanks for blessing us to be a blessing. May you find us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.